and we'll get started. So for a close reading, we pay specific attention to individual words. The first line of this poem, Vince, if you could read it for us. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit. Of man's first disobedience. The use of the word first here suggests what? There's many more to come. There's many more to come. Exactly. Um, let's see, Mr. Gardner, what is the definition of disobedience? To do what you are not supposed to do. So this is going to be a story of, which that's how all epic poems begin, of this. Of the first time that man did what? What they weren't supposed to do. What they weren't supposed to do. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree. That multiple F sound, fruit forbidden. What do we call that? Alliteration. Alliteration. And what was that forbidden tree that we talked about? Knowledge of good and Pausing for just a moment, why would the tree of knowledge be forbidden to Adam and Eve? Well, it's knowledge of good and evil. They don't know about evil. How is the only way you can know evil? By knowing good, and evil is that which is not good. So going back to Gulliver's Travels and that philosopher's statement in Book Two, what is the only way you can know evil? Comparing. Nothing is evil. Nothing is good, except by comparison. The tree of knowledge of good and evil would offer up what? A comparison. Exactly. So is anything actually? Well, consider this. How could Adam and Eve have sinned if there was no choice? And if there is no choice, there's no potential to sin. So, in order to give them the potential to sin, there has to be the creation of choice. So the central question here is, did Adam and Eve really actually have a choice? Or did they pretty much have to do this so that there will be the potential to determine that which is good by having something which is evil. This has been one of the central questions that philosophers and theologians have debated. Was there even really a choice at the center of the Garden of Eden? You know, we often talk about free will and how we are free to make those choices and everything, but scientists and people who study genetics have often argued that there is no free will in terms of choice because we are already have a genetic disposition towards certain things. It's like if I say, all right, you can choose chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream. Well, you already have a genetic preference toward one or the other based on taste. So it's an illusion of choice. You're going to be like, well, I choose chocolate ice cream. Why? Because I like chocolate ice cream. Why do you like chocolate ice cream? Well, because your taste buds are designed in such a way as to put the taste of chocolate over the taste of vanilla. So you don't actually have a choice between the two. You can be like, yes, 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 I could choose vanilla, but you're willing your body to choose something over what it would actually desire. So really, that's not a choice, that is simply replacing that which you desire with something that you feel you need to choose in order to create an illusion of choice. The question is, is there really free will for Adam and Eve? Well, let me create a tree and put it here solely so that you have something you're not allowed to do. Then let me put someone in here who's going to tempt you into doing that which you're not supposed to do, alluring you into it so that you'll have something to compare it to. Not what I'm supposed to do versus what I'm supposed to do. Now, did he put Satan in there, or should we go with the Paradise Lost logic and say that Satan found his way in? The Paradise Lost logic is that in Book 2, which I'm sorry for not having you read, I'm sure you can okay. okay, that's okay. In Book 2, Satan leaves hell Kind of like this. Into the breasts. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Cleavage. Uh, actually, when he opens the gates of hell, it's blackness, night, and chaos. He dives into it and falls and falls and falls and falls and falls until finally he finds a path. And then he lands on earth. So it, it's like he found his way to earth, except here's what's weird. The whole time, God is watching in heaven. Turns to Jesus and says, there he goes. He's on his way to earth. He's going to go tempt Adam and Eve, and they're going to fall in sin. If only I had someone to redeem them. Hey, anyone want to redeem them? 
The angels are silent. Finally, Jesus says, I'll go. I'll do it. Then everyone starts clapping. That's, that, that's how Milton tells us. Well, I mean, exactly. it's not what a martyr. If we believe in an omniscient God, then we have to assume that he allowed things to happen, which is basically letting him in. The idea of omniscience seems to suggest that the creation of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the creation of not a choice, but a direct requirement to eat more or less. Mm -hmm. I'm going to create something that I know they're going to be tempted by and do. Mm -hmm. Thus the problem of the whole story mm -hmm. of that forbidden tree. And note this, it says, it says, whose mortal taste, what do we associate with the word mortal? Human. Death. Human, death, sin. The tree brought what into the world? Death. Death. And notice the next three words. And all our woe. All of a sudden, our speaker in this poem has included who? Us. Us. Himself, the reader, and every living human. In other words, all our woe, all of Sam's problems and her hurts and frustrations, all of Ola's frustrations and hurts and, and inner things, all of that crap is from that stupid tree in that garden whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe. Now, we're still setting this up. Of the first disobedience and the fruit of the tree, with loss of Eden, till one greater man, who's that greater man? Jesus. Now, greater is an adjective in what sense? Comparative. Comparative, remember? No one is great except by comparison. One greater man, well, so far, we've only mentioned one man, and that's Adam. So who is Jesus greater than? Adam. Have you heard the phrase that he's the second Adam? I don't know if you discussed that in any of your first yeah. classes. He's looked at him in the um, classic text as the second Adam, the stronger Adam. In other words, Adam 2.0. He is the second one to come. And in doing so, it says in the next line, to restore us and regain the blissful seat, comma. And now we have the next three words. Sing heavenly muse. Okay, quick mythological reference. Who are the muses? They tell tales. They tell tales. They are the, the nine classical things that live. Um, Olympus and entertainment. Yes, they live, they live in, in that classical world, and they're said to inspire the arts, they're said to inspire history and music and all these things. The muse inspires people to do these great things in culture. Who is the heavenly muse? Think of the triune God, think of the aspect of the triune God that would be muse-like. The ghost? The ghost or the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Milton is saying, sing heavenly muse. In other words, Milton is saying, my muse for this is the Holy Spirit. Are you familiar with the term divine inspiration? Yes. What does that mean? Something inspired divine. What does inspired mean? Breathed into. If your scriptures are divinely inspired, it means they were written by the hand of God using an amanuensis, or a penman. Milton is arguing that this text was written by who? God. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Sing heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd. Who was the shepherd on Sinai? Moses. Moses. Moses who first taught the chosen seed. Who was the chosen seed? Israel. The Israelites. He taught the chosen seed in the beginning. Where do those three words come from? Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1. And according to ancient tradition, who wrote Genesis? Moses. Moses. He wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. In the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Does anyone know the whole first verse of Genesis? In the beginning, in the beginning, the earth 
was without form and void. In the beginning. Now, the actual verse that we know is, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But it follows it up by saying, the earth was without form and void. So, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. He took it and created something. And it says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit was present in creation. Now, look what it says next. Delight me more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Ionian mount. Let me read you a footnote here. The Ionian mount is Helicon, the mountain on which the classical muses live. Look at the language Milton's using here. Intends to soar above the Ionian Mount. What is he saying about his poem? No, it's inspired, like the inspiration is better than that of the muses. Therefore, my poem is going to be better than what? They're not that. That is boastful. Better than what? No. Better than the epic poems in the world. The Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. Because those were inspired by the classical muses. My muse soars above the Ionian Mount. That's where the classical muses lived. Mine soars above. And look at what he says next. While it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> People, this is line 16 of the poem, and he's saying, this is the greatest thing ever written. First of all, it's inspired by God. Thank you very much. And it's going to do things unattempted yet, in prose or rhyme, in all of literature. It's going to be better than the other poems, because my story is more epic and more central. Look at the next few lines. He says, and chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all tempers the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest. How does the Holy Spirit know what happened? He's God. He was there. It says, Thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like, satst brooding on the vast of it, and madest it pregnant. Now here we go to the central words here. This is the central purpose, the main idea. Milton calls upon the Holy Spirit and says, What in me is dark, what? What in me is dark, next word. Oh, illumined. Which means what? Light up. Light up. Oh, holy light, holy spirit, light up what is dark. Which, by the way, a little subnote here. Milton was blind when he wrote Paradise Lost. What? So there's a little bit of a subtext here of, How many write I cannot see, so I want you to see for me. And actually he wrote it by speaking, speaking it out loud, and his daughters wrote it down. True story. He's we'll blind. See. And we'll see several references to that. He says, What in me is dark illumined, what is low grace and support, that to the height of this great argument, he's saying, in other words, so I can do this, and here are the two most important lines in the first 26 lines, the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence, and do what? Justify the ways of God. There it is. The central purpose of this entire 12 books of poetry, the central purpose of Paradise Lost, of this huge epic poem, is Milton, as a poet, attempting to justify the ways of God to men. You've got issues with God. You've got issues with Christianity. You want to know why we're here, what our purpose is. You want to know why bad things happen. Let me explain. Now, on one level, why is that seemingly almost blasphemous? Because he's going to prove God. What makes, you think you can, what makes you think you can explain God? And, what about God? He's on the I mean, does he need justification? And it's like your parents when they say, when you say why, what do, what do they say? Because, they don't have to I say because I said so, and you don't need to know why. God, if anyone can say that, can say that. 
But here's Milton saying, in the grandest line in the poem, in the grandest poem in the English language, I'm going to justify the ways of God to men. Boom! There it is. Now, when we start next time, we're going to touch upon a few key things in books 4 and 9, but I wanted you to capture the essence, the central purpose of this poem going into it. What we're going to do is, uh, we have another one of these response essays to write, yay, lucky you. I shortened this one a bit because I felt sorry for you. This one is only two to three pages. It's on Swift. So it should be pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's a lot of what we already talked about with Swift, but it is a submission to turnitin.com. The next time we meet, which is Tuesday, we are going to spend the entirety of our class on Hamlet. Go! This copy of Hamlet, the text is only on the one side, like in Beowulf. Yay! It's a five-act play. Honestly, if you just read the whole thing, it will probably only take you two and a half hours to read. Yeah. Read the whole thing. That's pretty good. Now, here's the problem. Thursday, there's not much of a turnaround time between Tuesday and Thursday. On Thursday next week, we start poetry. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the poetry textbook in case you want to read ahead. In the event that you want to read ahead, since there's more time this weekend than the one between Tuesday and Thursday, you can do so. The poetry textbook is broken up into chapters. Each chapter has information and then example poems. This is AP edition. Yeah, can I not have a BT edition? In the event that you want to read ahead in poetry, read chapters two through five, but don't read the poems. Only read the text, the information. It won't take you very long. Because for Thursday, you're going to have to read a lot of chapters. So if you want to read ahead, do that. What chapters? Two, two through five, only the text. Don't read the poem examples. It won't take you very long. Tuesday, Hamlet, write your essay, submit the turnitin.com and possibly start reading this. Keep Gulliver's Travels, because you'll need that for your paper, but turn everything else into me that you don't need right now. Is it all Hamlet? All Hamlet. I'll take your papers, I'll take all the writing you did today, you can put it in the stack, and I'll see you Tuesday. Two through five. Two through five.